Hello, everybody. Good morning. Check, check, check. And it works. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is the gathering. This is a service here at First Methodist Fort Worth. Uh, this is a new place for new people. As if, the, if this is your first time being here, I'm so thankful that you have joined us today. This place was made for you. Uh, if you haven't already, please make sure to get a cup of coffee and something to eat off the table in the back. Uh, if you need a refill or something else during the entire service, please make sure to get up and do so. Also, I just want to let you know, if you're one of the folks at the very end and you're having to kind of crane your neck, please feel free to just kind of rotate your chair so it faces up to the front. Everything's going to be happening right around here. So if it's not comfortable to see, uh, please make sure to do so. A couple announcements before we get going. Uh, first announcement I have to make, if you're not familiar, that the, there's actually two gathering services that take place on a uh, Sunday morning. There's this service here at 930. There's a second service at 11 o'clock. Do you have that announcement slide? Um, the, uh, I want you to know that the, the 11 o'clock service was formerly held across the street at the Justin Building. It will be for one more Sunday. Uh, But if anyone you know, or if you ever want to go to a later service, starting next Sunday, it's going to be back up in room 350, which is the room that the gathering all started in. It's just a lighter room. It's a little airier. Uh, A lot of people wanted to stay in the same building as their kids when their kids were uh, in the nursery and things along those lines. So we're going to go back to that space just for the 11 o'clock service. So pop quiz, is the 930 service moving locations? No. No. What service is moving? And it is moving to room. I have a five-year-old. This is literally how we do things. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much. At the 11 o'clock next week is going to room 350. Uh, now, another announcement. Today's a special Sunday in the life of the church. It's something called UMW Sunday. Uh, UMW stands for United Methodist Women. This is one of the strongest ministries uh, and collections of people at our church. And uh, our own Samantha Morgan, who's in the gathering every Sunday, uh, would like. she insisted. She's like, Lance, I have to talk. Give me the microphone. Public speaking is my favorite thing. Uh, So, uh, Samantha, please. Uh, Good morning. So, um, it is UMW Sunday, and I just wanted to take a minute um, to talk to you all about UMW. Uh, United Methodist Women is the largest denominational faith-based organization for women, um, with over half a million members worldwide, and a strong history in this church of um, local service to missions and organizations that serve women, children, and youth. Um, Our focus is women and children and youth, and we hold monthly luncheons here on the first Tuesday of the month at 1130 right here in Wesley Hall. Um, You don't have to be a member of UMW to attend, um, so we welcome you um, to come join us at any of those meetings. Our program chair this year is Amber Shive, and she's done a really great job of lining up wonderful speakers every month around our theme this year, which is traditions, faith, family, and Fort Worth. Um, And in addition to our general meetings on the first Tuesday of every month, we also have circles that meet throughout the month um, that are mainly based around life stage. Our newest circle is called Rachel, and that was organized for women who are getting ready to be empty nesters, um, who have children who have just gone off to college. Um, All of our circles meet at different locations and different times. Um, Some are during the day, some are in the evening. So whatever your schedule is like, uh, you can find a circle that, that fits your needs. Um, also wanted to let you know about our spring fundraiser. This is going to be April 10th at Ridgely Country Club. Our speaker this year is Malone, who's the midday DJ for our local radio station, 95.9 The Ranch. Um, and she's going to be giving a talk um, that ties into our uh, theme of faith in Fort Worth. Um, that's a really fun event, and it also raises a lot of money. Um, from our last fundraiser this past spring, along with some money from our endowment, we were able to give $35,000. Um, to local missions. Um, We're set up in the garden all morning this morning, so if you're looking for um, a meaningful way to give back locally and to form some deeper relationships with the women in our church, um, please come out and talk to us. We'd love to to talk with you and answer any questions you have and help you find a place in UMW. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, Samantha's going to speak again here in just a second, but the... uh, In in case you aren't familiar, UMW is a denomination-wide thing. United Methodist Church is everywhere. And a lot of Methodist churches, uh, UMW is particularly strong uh, with the greatest generation uh, and uh, age group of the church. Our United Methodist Women's Group uh, is particularly strong in that area and is also, I'm blown away over and over again, how strong the United Methodist Women is uh, with women in their 50s and their 40s and their 30s and even in their 20s here at our church. It's truly an incredible uh, organization with something for everybody. So as long as you are a woman. Um, so 
Uh, if you've ever wanted to consider, please go out there. They have cookies. It's a chance to visit. You'll learn a lot about how to get connected with others here at the church. Speaking of getting connected, uh, today is something that we do occasionally here at the church. It's called a joining Sunday. Uh, so what we do if, uh, is we, we regularly engage new people here at the gathering. A lot of people uh, who've never been a part of a church or who specifically have been a part of a church, but it's been a really long time, uh, are connecting back here. People are joining all the time uh, in a lot of one-on-one conversations, but uh, every once in a while I try to make it really clear and open an opportunity for a bunch of people just to come forward and join together if you feel called to do so. Uh, a number of you have indicated over the past few weeks and months that you're ready to join the church. Today is the day to do it. If you have not communicated with me that you want to join the church, uh, but in your mind you really love the idea of it, it is not too late. You can join today. If you haven't been baptized, you can be baptized today. That's all going to take place here during the service at the end after communion. So what we're going to do uh, is while everyone is going through the communion lines, we're going to meet over here on the other side of the piano. Uh, and if today is the day that you want to profess your faith in Christ and be a part of this portion of the body of Christ, the church, then simply come forward and meet me. Uh, we'll have a brief joining liturgy. And then afterwards, you'll go do a couple bit of paperwork because we are Methodist. Uh, and we have never met an Excel spreadsheet that we didn't love. So uh, just wanted to make aware today is a great day of joining, and I'm so thankful for those of you uh, who are ready to take that step today. Last but not least, when you sat down today in your chairs, every single one of you had a big piece of paper. If you would do me a favor and take a look at it, uh, this is a piece of paper telling you about something called Focus First. Focus First is a process that our church is going through over the course of the next year that has been born out of something extremely wonderful. As you're very aware of, Fort Worth is a growing, vibrant city. Uh, it's one of the most thriving uh, cities in the United States of America, and our church is a thriving church planted exactly in the heart of that amazing city. And our church feels very clearly called uh, to, con to continue to witness and serve uh, as a community of God's love in the world, making disciples here in the city of Fort Worth. And there is such an opportunity ahead of us that we want to make sure that before we do so, we take a very particular time to listen and to discern what kind of church God is calling us to be. Focus first is the process of doing that. So there's two very important ways I need you to participate in this. First, this week, a survey was released. Uh, it's available online. You have information on how to access it on that sheet of paper. You have a QR code on that you can take a picture with your phone and send you right there. And this survey takes 10 minutes or less to complete, and it asks the questions, who are we, who is our neighbor, and what kind of church is God calling us to be? This survey helps us understand, uh, who are you? Why are you here? What do you find enriching at this church? How is God speaking to you through this congregation? How are you growing as a disciple? What do we do well? This process of positive inquiry will help us get a better understanding of who we are as a church. Uh, I'm one of the people who's helping to lead this process, serving in a small group of people that's helping to organize it. So as a favor to me, whether this is your first time here at the church or you're a long-term member or you're somewhere in between, whether you're a guest or a visitor or whether this has been your home for a long time, no matter who you are, we desperately want your feedback and your input into this process. Together, we're gonna be able to discern uh, who God is calling us to be as a church. I'm gonna ask that you take that survey today. Come on, y'all. You got 15 minutes today. Let's do it. The Cowboys aren't playing until tomorrow night, <laughs> right? You can go ahead and get it done. If you can't do it today, do it tomorrow. Complete the survey, please. It takes 10 minutes or less. I can't tell you how valuable your input would be. Additionally, because no survey can perfectly capture all the information we need, coming out up in October, there's going to be four dates, the 8th, the 11th, the 15th, and the 18th. Those are two Sundays and two Wednesdays, during which we will be holding focus groups. Uh, this is another process of positive inquiry, and we ask some interested members of our church to come forward and participate in a process where we help us understand who are we as a church and who is God calling us to be in the city of Fort Worth in the future. Uh, again, I cannot impress enough how valid, uh, how valuable, how important your feedback and your participation is. Uh, I ask that you, you make a commitment to come to participate in one of those times. Uh, just one. If you can come to any one of them, uh, it'll be a chance for us to listen, to hear, to know, and to discern together. So those are coming up in October. More information is going to be coming through every single one of our communication channels. At the end of the day, the question is, who are we? Who is our neighbor? And what kind of church is God calling us to be for the making of disciples of Jesus Christ, not only next year, but for the years to come. So thank you so much for participating. It's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I hope that you uh, take some time to help us uh, understand how you feel God working in our midst. So that being said, uh, one last bit. What we always do here is um, start with a time of worship. Uh, Shalia, our worship leader, had a long-standing commitment to be out of town today, so we're going to be doing it old school again with a YouTube video. Uh, if you've never experienced before, it's weird and we know it. 
Uh, so what we're going to do is just hang out in a second, drink a cup of coffee, watch a worship video, uh, let it open your, hi- your hearts and minds and prepare you for worship. And while that's happening, we're going to be passing baskets throughout the congregation. Uh, two things go in the baskets. One is your attendance card. It was in your seat when you sat down. Whether this, again, is your first time or your 50th time, we ask that you make note of joining us here today. If you're giving me your email address, I'll occasionally contact you with emails with things that are happening here at the church. Uh, additionally, we ask that you give your financial gifts, your tithes and your offerings, to support the work of God in the world through this portion of the body of Christ, the church. If you're one of the people like my family who gives online, there's a little marker in your uh, chair that you can place in the basket uh, to indicate that. So uh, let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship as Samantha leads us. Call in the name of God and give thanks. Make known God's deeds among the people. (laughs) Okay. Call on the name of God and give thanks. Make known God's deeds among the people. Sing and tell of God's wonderful works. Let those who seek God rejoice in their hearts. Let us worship God. Amen.
the things that we do every time we gather together as a church is to speak to God together, knowing that God listens. Listen to God together, knowing that God speaks. We do this through what we call prayers of the people. I'm going to lead us first in a prayer of confession, and at the end, I'll say, Lord, in your mercy, and you'll all say, hear our prayers. Let's try that. Lord, in your mercy. Then lead us through a Trinitarian prayer, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer. It's all language for God's Trinitarian nature. Then I'll lift up the names of some individuals, and I'll say, are there any others? And when I say, are there any others, it's your chance to lift up the names of some people who we have, are aware of that have joys that we want to bring to God in celebration and thanksgiving. Uh, it's a chance to lift up the names of some people who have special times of grief or loss or loneliness or hopelessness or despair that we want to come and lay on the altar before God. In a community this size, we don't try to speak one at a time. We just kind of speak out, and our, our voices run over and against each other. And that's beautiful because that's how God always and everywhere hears our prayers. This is prayers of the people. So let us prepare our hearts and minds and go to God together in prayer. Please pray with me. God of fruitful love, life sometimes brings out the worst in us. At home, at school, in the workplace, even in our relationship with you, we too easily question what others do and get instead of tending first to our own hearts and souls. God, take away our bitterness. Teach us the art of repentance and forgiveness. Give us grateful hearts, we pray. And Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Creator God, you made this world and everything in it and called it good. You created each and every one of us and called us good. Evidence of that goodness and your love continues to burst forth all around us. New hope, new life, new love, new jobs, new family, new friends, new opportunities. For all of this, O oh God, we sing your praise and give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. At the same time, O oh God, we still live in a world where our freedom can be exercised for purposes of sinfulness against your wishes and your will. For this, O oh God, we repent. But remind us that in the midst of all of this, you did not give up on us, did not turn away from us, did not forsake us. Instead, you joined us in the life, the presence, and the power of your Son, Jesus the Christ for the purposes of remaking and reconciling us back to you for once, for always, forever. For this, O oh God, we sing your praise and give you thanks, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. God, always and everywhere, being one of your people in the world is difficult. The world teaches us to be one way, O oh God, you teach us to be something very different. But remind us in the midst of all of our struggles and our doubts that we are never alone. That through the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, you walk alongside us, guide us, strengthen us now and every day of our lives. For this, O oh God, we sing your praise and give you thanks, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our, Hear our prayers. prayers. For Hazel, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. For Indy, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. For our brothers and sisters in Puerto Rico, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Are there any others? Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. For all of these names, O God, and for the names held in the stillness of our heart, Hear our prayers. For those who struggle and suffer, hear our prayers. For us in our hours of need, hear our prayers. Loving God, creator of everything, redeemer of everything, sustainer of everything, guide us, keep us, shape us in your ways, and Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Hear our prayers. Amen. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome again. My name is Lance Marshall. I'm one of the, I am the junior varsity pastor here at First United Methodist Church. I always want to say one of, but I'm the one. So uh, I'm glad that you're with us today here at the gathering. One of the ways that we structure our time together in the gathering is through something we call series. Uh, it's, a, it's an opportunity to talk on a set of topics or a book of the Bible a number of weeks in a row. Uh, you can always catch up on a series on a podcast or our YouTube channel or anything along those lines. If you search my name or the church's name, you'll find it. I uh, want to let you know that we actually start a new series next week 
Uh, you may not be familiar, but at the end of this month is the 500th anniversary to the day, a nice round anniversary of Martin Luther uh, nailing the 95 theses to the Wittenberg door, uh, the, the, uh, the door of the community of faith in Wittenberg, Germany. And the nailing of those theses was a major watershed moment. It's a, it's a moment uh, that radically changed that church, that radically changed all churches, that radically changed your life and your relationship with God, right? That moment changed things for you. It changed the way that you understand God. It changed the way that God was communicated to you. It changed the way that faith was communicated to you. It changed the way that you encounter scripture and worship, sin and salvation, everything. That moment, that hammer and nail and those pieces of paper hitting that door changed things for you. And so we will spend the month of October reflecting on those changes and what those changes taught us about God, about ourselves and what it is to be a faithful person. So we're gonna use that language, uh, radical faith. Uh, to discuss what Martin Luther did uh, and how he, a radical, uh, dramatically changed everything that you've come to know and experience about faithfulness in God. Can't wait. I'm a history buff. There's going to be drama. Uh, there's going to be history. Hopefully, at the end of it, things make a lot more sense and you feel a lot more engaged. Uh, so can't wait to do that. Right now, we have been going through a series of talks uh, through the months of um, August and most of September on, on three topics that are very personal, that are very touchy, that are very intimate. They're the topics of sex, death, and money. And, uh, and we talked about all these um, in, in, uh, in great depth. You can go back and catch up on the uh, podcast if you want to get a little bit more information on all of those topics. Uh, we tried to take the principle of the thing behind the thing, right? Understand why are these topics so touchy? Why, why are they so personal? Why are they so private? Because when we're talking about those things, we're really talking about something much more intimate and difficult, right? You know, when we talk about... Uh, our relationship and our understanding of sex, what we're really talking about are all of these things that have to do with vulnerability, right? And intimacy of knowing and being known, uh, of truly encountering someone uh, for who they are, right? And how difficult that can be, uh, what it is to be satisfied, what it is to feel complete in the world, right? We're talking about all of these content, uh, all of these uh, uh, concepts that are so rich and so personal. As we talked about that at great length, when we talked about death, we talked about the understanding that, you know, when we talk about death, of course, what we're really talking about is life. You know, like what is it to live? Uh, and uh, and have, you know, having a good death is always wrapped up in, in uh, the concept of what it is to live a good life. And so we talked about that uh, to a great extent. We also talked about the understanding that death is the one thing that every single one of us gets to plan on doing at some point, right? That's in the calendar somewhere. Uh, it's the one thing we get to all plan on doing, and yet it's the one thing for which many of us have no preparation, right? It's to come, but don't ever talk about what can you expect, right? What's the actual process of experiencing looking like? So we talked a little bit about that, the idea of the thing behind the thing. We talked about money, right? Everyone's favorite topic of sermons. Everyone loves a good money sermon. It's in all the church growth handbooks, right? Uh, and we were talking about money, and we were talking about the thing behind the thing, uh, the understanding that, you know, what we think about money says a lot about what we think about God and God's provision and our life and, and our, the way that we fit into the whole world, right? The thing behind the thing. So we talked about these uh, really directly, hopefully, helpfully, um, over the course of the last month. You can catch up if you want. This is the last week. I kind of saved it as a capper and a review, right? Wanted to go back and talk about it. And I'll be honest with you, this may shock you, right? This may totally scandalize you, but when I was planning out the series in advance over the course of the summer, I planned these seven weeks. And I knew that I wanted to talk about each of those topics for two weeks. And on week seven, I was like, then I'll talk about something. <laughs> right? Um, the, uh, that may shock you um, only if you're very new here. <laughs> I just knew that there was going to be something else we had to talk about. Right? And over the course of preparing for this sermon series and walking through the messages and spending time with it and reflecting on it in my own life, uh, I, I realized really quickly what that was going to be. And so uh, the topic I want to talk about is um, based on something that you may have experienced. So when we're talking about these topics, right, I mean, these sex, death, and money are like the most intimate topics of our life, the most personal things, right? I'll be honest, I am like old school prudish. These are things I do not talk about, right, with my friends, my associates. Uh, whatever, like I am, I'm a pretty old school person, right? I grew up in a family where you do not talk about like people's salaries or stuff like that, right? And that is still something that I very much understand. I do not know anybody else's salary on the entire planet Earth except for me, my wife, and every professional athlete. 
That is just something like you do not talk about, right? I do not have any, and that is all like private, right? Um, you know, the first topic, of course, incredibly private, right? There's something that you don't air out. These are internal, right? These are secret, personal, held close to the vest topics for the most of us, right? And uh, one of the things that was really helpful for me as I was going through, you know, the, the weeks of preparing for all these topics is it, it's really a cause to search deep inside yourself, right? It's really a cause to think closely, uh, to uncover things, to open the doors and windows of your heart, to reflect on your own life and these most private things that I don't talk to anybody else about with, uh, I don't reflect out loud with very many other people on, to think closely about these most intimate aspects of myself, right? And I hope that some of you had some of those, those similar experiences, right? When you're thinking about these most private topics, you're doing a lot of reflection on who you are and who you understand yourself to be. And maybe, maybe you're like me, and as you grow as a Christian, as you attend worship, as you pray, uh, as you serve, as you give, as you, as you learn more about God through studying scriptures, you might come to understand more and more and more who God is and what God's about, right? The priorities of God, right? That uh, God is on this process of changing the world, changing hearts and lives. God is shaping the coming of God's kingdom, and it has to do uh, with everyone having enough, with people living and experiencing justice, uh, with the, you know, the priorities and the purposes of God being first and foremost, not in individual hearts and lives, but our entire community as a whole, right? You might come to understand each one of those things better, but as you search the most interior aspects of your life, you may come to realize that you are not perfectly aligned with God's plans and purposes. I may be the only one, <laughs> Right? It's really easy to point out some people that we see on the news or in our Facebook feeds or in our lives or whatever, and we can see these people's priorities and purposes are completely anti-God, right? These people are selfish, they're racist, they're greedy, they're violent, they're angry, they're mistrusting, right? We can see very clearly some people's purposes and priorities are totally against what God is trying to do with individual lives and with the world, right? It's really easy to point those people out. If you're like most of us, though, as you encounter your own life, as you reflect on who you are, you see so many ways in which you are in lockstep with God most of the way, right? I'm also about peace and justice and love and equality for own people as long as I also get what I want when I want it. Close, but not quite, right? I'm also for everyone getting a fair chance, for everyone for getting a fair shake, for everyone getting a chance to live and love unless I think they're lazy, right? Maybe you find that. Um, by the way, one of the things I want to point out, there's no pastoral exemptions for this, right? I was reflecting, thinking about the money sermon and the money messages for the last couple of weeks. I was reflecting on my own life, and I'm thinking and writing and planning on all these ways and like what you say about how you spend money and what you think about money says so much about what you think about God and how you spend money is a huge window in your priorities and how you understand your part of what God is doing in the world. I'm saying and speaking all those things to you, right? And while I'm saying and speaking all those things to you, I am giving sacrificially to my church. I am prioritizing my family uh, for you know the, the most important things. I am, I am participating in every way that I think God uh, would have me participate in the world. And there's you know some money left over for our family and for us to use. And so I'm saying all this stuff to you and I'm doing all these things. And at the same time, I'm looking at that little bit of money that I have left over and I am thinking about a new camera, <laughs> right? Because I love photography. And in the last week, I have been burning up keh.com, bhphotovideo.com, and dpreview.com, YouTube videos. I'm studying this thing like I should be studying the Bible, right? We're looking at all these reviews of cameras, and I'm thinking about the new camera that I so desperately need, right? I'm thinking about all of this, and I'm speaking to you, and I'm reflecting. And then somewhere, uh, I realized last week um, the obvious, which is that photography is my hobby, and it's something that, that calms me and soothes me. Um, it's something that helps me refresh and recharge and, and hopefully have something to come back and offer to all of you. It's very important to my life and my, my self-care and my well-being, and the camera ain't the thing that's limiting how good the pictures are <laughs> in my life right now, right? Someday there's going to be a time where that's going to be a reasonable and faithful purchase that my family has prepared for, and that is okay, right? That will be a thing. I realized last week that the reason that I was searching for a new camera is that I'm feeling really stressed. And I'm feeling really tired. And I'm in the middle of so many projects that it doesn't, that feels like a, it's hard to get a win 
on a day-to-day -day basis, and I am looking for a new camera because I am looking for that shot of dopamine that makes me feel good when I buy something. In the last couple weeks, in the middle of sermon series uh, about, uh, about uh, money and its place in the world, right, I am in the middle of saying, like, I am all about peace, justice, uh, the right orientation of everything I have for God's purposes, unless I feel bad or guilty, and then I'll spend money on something to make me happy. Right? That's how I felt in this last week. Right? I experienced this gulf between God's purposes, God's priorities, not for me, but for the entire world. And I came to realize I am so on board with so many of things, but there is still a gulf between who I am and what God would have me be. Right? And usually, when we reflect on this, we have an emotion, we have a feeling about ourselves. It starts with the word G. We feel bad, we feel ashamed, we look down on ourselves, we feel guilty, right? Look at me, a clergy person, speaking about money and at the same time just absolutely burning up how he can spend this extra money on something to make him feel happy, right? Can I be honest with you? I don't feel guilty. In fact, I feel really good that I came to that realization. How do I move from feeling guilty about recognizing this about myself, to feeling good, to feeling grateful. Look at that alliteration, right? Oh, that'll preach. How do I move from feeling guilty about this to actually feeling grateful for what God's doing in the midst of my life based on my understanding of who I am and who Jesus is? In the middle of examining these most intimate and personal things in my life, I have come to realize, like many of us come to realize over and over and over again, that there is some gulf in our life between who we are and who God would have us be, and yet somehow actually coming to recognize it doesn't make me feel guilty, doesn't make me feel bad. It actually makes me feel good and grateful for who God is and what God is doing. How do we come to that realization? Let's read the Bible. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Acts, chapter 13. If you got your Bible uh, with you, it's the, it's the first book that comes after the, gas the Gospels. The Gospels? <laughs> it's the first book after the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the book of Acts. Uh, Acts is a, it's a continuation of the writing of the, of the um, Apostle Luke. Uh, it is the story of the early church, right? One of the stars of the book of Acts is a young man uh, named Paul. Uh, Paul has previously been an extremely faithful Jew whose faithfulness led him to the persecution of the earliest church. He then has an encounter with the resurrected Christ, uh, a revelation of who God is and what God is doing through Jesus, transforms him forever, and he goes to become the greatest theologian and the greatest apostle uh, as far as church planting goes in the history of the church. Acts 13 uh, is a story that stars him in his work. So he's going to these different communities, right? He's sharing this revelation, this life-changing revelation of what God is doing through Jesus Christ. In this story, uh, he's going to speak to a synagogue, a faithful community of Jews, right? And he's going to share the story of what God has done through Jesus Christ. So he's coming up to them. He's trying to explain who God is and what God does. And he's speaking to this community. And so he doesn't start just by saying, well, Jesus lived and died and was resurrected. He starts by tying it together through everything that God has done. In Acts chapter 13, he's talking uh, to this community of faithful Jewish people in this little church in a city named after Antioch, and he's speaking to them, and he says, remember what God did in the beginning? When God pulled aside the patriarchs, right? Our ancestors, and said, through you I am going to be, I'm going to make a faithful covenant community. To you I'm going to make promises of who I am and what I am about. I'm going to teach you what my ways are in the world. I'm going to teach you my priorities and my purposes. I'm going to lift up amongst you kings like David, right? People who aren't perfect, but people whose defining characteristic is the fact that even when they mess up, they're still trying so hard to seek after me. I'm going to give you little rules and regulations through the prophet Moses and through others that guide you on what it is to live and act faithfully in pursuit of who I would have you be, right? God is going to reveal and teach all of this to us. And what it has resulted in is a community of people who know the right way, but just can't manage to do it, right? Who've been given directions, who've been given instructions, but can't just manage to achieve it no matter how hard they try the rules and the regulations end up making them feel worse about themselves as opposed to better right but god has had a plan from the very beginning on how to take the people of the world and make them understand who god is and what god would have them do and actually give them the strength the power and the authority to live in accordance with god's purposes and good news guess what it happened in acts chapter 13 verse 23 through 39 he says this from this man's descendants, Paul says, talking about David, right? The authority, the leadership of the people of Israel. From this man's descendants, God brought to Israel a savior. Jesus, just as God promised. 
Before Jesus' appearance, John proclaimed to all the Israelites a baptism to show they were changing their hearts and lives. As John was completing his mission, he said, Who do you think I am? I'm not the one you think I am, but he is coming after me. Your Savior is coming after me. I'm not worthy to loosen his sandals. Brothers, children of Abraham's family, and you Gentile God worshipers, meaning those who aren't Jews but who have discovered God, the message about this salvation has been sent to us. The people in Jerusalem and their leaders didn't recognize Jesus. By condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Even though they didn't find a single legal basis for the death penalty, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they finished doing everything that had been written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. He appeared over many days to those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to the people. We proclaim to you the good news. What God promised to our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it was written in the second psalm, you are my son. Today I have become your father. God raised Jesus from the dead, never again to be subjected to death's decay. Therefore, God said, I will give to you the holy and firm promises I made to David. In another place, it is said, you will not let your holy one experience death's decay, meaning your power will never cease. David served God's purposes in his own generation. Then he died and was buried with his ancestors. He experienced death's decay. But the one whom God has raised up did not experience death's decay. His power has never ceased. Therefore, brothers and sisters, know this. Through Jesus, we proclaim, proclaim the forgiveness of sins to you. From all those sins from which you couldn't be put in right relationship with God through Moses' law, through Jesus, everyone who believes is put in right relationship with God. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. Paul needs you to understand that the deeper and the harder that you look at your own life, no matter how hard you are trying to follow the rules about sex, death, money, whether to eat food sacrificed to idols, how to live faithfully in the midst of a complicated political or business climate, how to have a faithful marriage, how to be a good person, how to put God first in the world, no matter how hard you try to follow all of these rules, you will find yourself over and over again recognizing the fact that you are falling short, sometimes in great ways, sometimes in small ways. You will recognize it over and over again. We have a name for that, but know this. Through Jesus Christ, God has given you not only forgiveness, but the power that you need to make it right. This power of God, this right-making work of God, this transformative action of God is something that we call God's grace. Remember, if you're in a Methodist church, you don't know the answer, say Jesus. If that's not the right answer, say grace. And if that's not the right answer, get out of there because you're not in a Methodist church. <laughs> That's, that joke's coming again, by the way. <laughs> the grace of God, the power of God, the transforming work of God, the reconciling work of God is active in your life before you're ever aware of it. That's the work that we, that we baptize babies under, right? God is calling your name. God is reaching out to you. God is preveniently active in your life, placing people in your path, whispering into your ear. God is working in your favor and in your life before you are ever aware of it. We call that God's prevenient grace. And at the same time, at some point, you will recognize that you in your life, no matter how hard you tried, no matter how good you are, you ain't there yet, right? You will recognize that at some point, in the most public and outward ways, in the most internal and private ways, your priorities and your purposes, no matter how close they are, are not perfectly aligned with God's purposes, with God's plans. And at the same time, God will know each and every one of those things about you. And when you accept what God has done, you will be justified in the eyes of God, made right in the eyes of God, redeemed in the eyes of God, forgiven in the eyes of God. That is God's justifying grace, and God's not done with you then, right? If all God was offering was forgiveness, then each and every one of us would hold off accepting Jesus Christ in our lives until the very last moment, right? Trying to get that last absolution and then being done with it. In Bible study this week, we were listening words from Paul in the book of Romans, 
And then he was saying, well, if God offers forgiveness for all of our sins, right, then why not just keep on sinning, right? God offers forgiveness, right? If you're going to forgive me no matter what I do, then I've got a five-year-old, right? <laughs> if you're going to forgive me no matter what I do, then game on, <laughs> right? He says, no. You need to understand, once you have accepted God's grace, once you have let God's grace rule in your life, once you have let God's grace inside, sin no longer rules. It no longer has the power. It's no longer calling the shots. God continues to work in your life every single day. God continues to shape you more after the example of Jesus Christ, God's sanctifying grace, God's saint-making grace, God's life-changing grace continues to be active in your life over and over again. When you accept Jesus Christ, when you say yes, when you are in for the first time, you experience forgiveness for the first time, you may be changed to some extent, but I promise you, you will still feel the pull away, right? Saying yes is not a magical elixir. It, you will still continue to figure whatever it is that continues to pull you away from God's purposes and God's plans, but you will also have the sanctifying grace of God in your life. And every single time you reach out to God in worship, you pray to God internally, you study the scriptures to learn more about God, you give sacrificially, you serve, you enjoy the goodness of God's life, every, the life that God's give, every single moment that you experience the means of grace, that's what we call it in our tradition, every single time you experience the means of grace, this power will be less and less in God's transforming power will be greater and greater. Still in my life, in the midst of sermon and planning and teaching about money and what it is to put God first, even I in my life still experience whatever it is about me that tries to find happiness and joy through consumption and purchases. That power still exists in my life. And yet that power is nowhere near as strong as it was a year ago. And it is nowhere near as strong as it was five years ago. And it is nowhere near as strong as it was before I ever heard the story of Jesus. I am being changed. I am being molded. I am being remodeled by God in the image of Christ over and over and over again. I am being transformed by what God is doing in me. And I ain't perfect yet, but I'm letting him work. The closer you examine the deepest part of yourselves, right, the more that you open those, those cupboards, the more that you open the windows in the heart of this, your soul, you will experience over and over again all the little ways and all the big ways in which your priorities and your purposes do not perfectly align with who God is and what God would have you be. And at the same time, Every time you experience corporate worship, every time you pray to God, every time you serve God in God's name, every time you study the scriptures to better understand God and who God would have you be, every time that you live sacrificially, every time you enjoy the goodness of the life that God gives, you are experiencing the means of this grace, this power, and your life will be transformed over and over and bit by bit into the person that God would have you be. And that is good, good news. Please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, any deep examination into our lives shows all the ways in which we still have ways to go. God, we thank you for your grace, your power calling our name, leading us to this place before we were ever aware of it. God, we give you thanks for your grace, reaching out to us, engaging us, forgiving us, washing us clean again and again when we only have the hearts and the minds to accept you and what you would have us do and become. And oh God, we give you thanks for your sanctifying grace, your transforming grace, your power in our life that every single day allows us to become more and more like Jesus. God, we continue to speak to us. God, continue to work within us, and God, continue to remake us day by day in the image of your Son, in whose name we pray the words that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite our communion stewards to come forward uh, and to assist with the serving of the bread and the cup. Every time we gather together as a church, we come to this table. We come to this moment. We come to this sacrament, this thin place, this sign of Christ and Christ's presence with each and every one of us. We talked about God's grace in the world made perfect, shown through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, showing that you can't reject it once and for all. You can't turn away from it once and for all. God continues to offer God's grace and God's presence every single moment you live and breathe on this planet. To show this, on the day he was to give himself up for us, uh, that he was having dinner with his best friends, his disciples, and as the dinner was coming to an end, he gave thanks over a piece of bread. We have nine up here. We have an extra. Um, producing on the fly. He gave thanks over a piece of bread, an ordinary piece of bread. He gave thanks over it, broke it, and passed it, and said, Take all of you and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the meal was over, he took a cup of ordinary table wine, gave thanks over it, blessed it, passed it, and said, Take all of you and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we do it in, uh, often in remembrance of the one who promises to offer grace, who promises to offer forgiveness, who promises to offer hope and love and reconciliation every single moment of our lives. This isn't the gathering table. This isn't the First United Methodist Church's table. This is Christ's table. And like Christ's grace, like his offer of hope, love, and salvation, it is open to all people, all backgrounds, all experiences, no matter who you are or who you think you are, this forgiveness, this table is here for you, all ages, all nations, all races. We always celebrate communion uh, with non-alcoholic grape juice because we don't want anyone to choose between sobriety and the sacraments. We will also have a special gluten-free station over here uh, for anyone who has sensitivity to wheat, um, special station with the cup and juice that hasn't had any contact with wheat. Uh, we always come forward down the center aisle with our hands held open like this. A piece of bread is placed in your hands. You then take it, dip it into the cup, eat it, go down the outside aisles, uh, and return to your seat for a time of silent prayer and reflection. The table is set. The meal is ready. Come forward. Be fed. And any who are joining, please uh, join me over here on the side.
right, so we are going to do a quick joining liturgy here. Uh, the liturgy of joining is, is similar to the liturgy of, ba litur the liturgy of baptism. Uh, one, one of the things that we ask everyone uh, to experience before joining the church is a baptism uh, entrance into the face. So all, all three of the folks who are joining today have been baptized. Uh, one of the things you need to understand about the United Methodist Church and our understanding of baptism, there is no re-baptism in the United Methodist Church. Uh, we believe that a baptism can't ever be redone because a baptism can't ever be undone. A baptism is an act of God initiating someone into God's uh, universal and holy church. And so we recognize the baptism of all faithful Christian communities. And all three of the people who are joining today are coming by transfer of membership from other uh, Christian communities. We honor and celebrate their baptism and welcome them here into life of the church. We're going to go through the liturgy, which is similar to the baptismal liturgy. There will be a portion uh, at which you all speak together because we're Methodist and we like to talk back. So uh, that being said, I'll let you know when it's your time. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. Through confirmation and through the reaffirmation of our faith and in joining the Christian communities, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism, acknowledge what God is doing for us, and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. I present Allison Roderick, Lila Wilson, and David Wilson, for member, uh, who come seeking professing membership in the First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth. Now to the three of you. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the word, world? As members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Now, Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. And now please join with me. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ, and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The God of all grace who has called us to eternal glory in Christ establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit that you may live in grace and peace. A round of applause, please, for our newest members of the church. I am going to ask that the three of them remain up here. If you would, please just come forward and say a hello and welcome these newest members of the community into membership of the church. Just a quick word and a reminder, please take with you the piece of paper. Uh, that's our advertisement for Focus First. It's going to give you directions on how to participate. We ask that all surveys be completed by the end of October, but guys, let's just do it today. Uh, please bow your head and receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face raise to shine upon you. And may you, the people of God, experience the transforming grace of Christ in your life now and every day that you live. Amen. Go in peace.